Living's Machines is a project that is using maps, it's using newspapers, it's using census returns, it's using large corpora of books in order to understand how the lives of ordinary people changed in the long 19th century. So Living with Machines was a bold collaboration between the British Library and the Alan Turing Institute. The Alan Turing Institute is the UK's um, Institute for AI and Data Science, and it's actually located inside the British Library. So what we have is a big institution holding the um, nation's collections, and inside it we have an institute that has the, the power to wrangle that data at scale. At the centre of every AI and machine learning project, there are actually people. So in the society, we talk quite a lot about technology, but one thing that we have seen in this project is that actually manipulating data, um, making up tools, algorithms, uh, setting up the project, it is all collaborative effort. Living with Machines um, gave itself this mission of, from the very beginning to be a project that is radically collaborative, that creates a new paradigm for academics to collaborate f coming from very different disciplines like data science and humanities. We knew we needed to bring together the right minds to make this project work. So we needed the people who are expert in the data. So that's the, uh, the librarians who have curated and held these materials. We needed data scientists um, and experts in AI who knew how to wrangle that data. But we also needed domain experts, historians, who understood the, the uh, historical significance of that data. We needed people who understood what language means. So we needed computational linguists um, to analyze um, the way that text and understanding changes over the 19th century. We needed experts in maps and people who are expert in the census. So we have this really diverse team. When you put smart people together in a room, they come from different backgrounds. It takes some time and some effort to get them to understand each other and to really click and connect. Radical collaboration can be, and probably is, a leap of faith. Collaboration is hard. It's great because it, it produces these fantastic results and you can do things that you couldn't hope to do uh, with one person alone. But it also means that you have to, to work really hard to make sure that you're, you're speaking the same language. It's about the terminology, it's about um, different traditions, and it will inevitably clash with the usual ways of working that do not account for this type of, of project. Historians are very used, and this is our model, you know, our whole model of working is really the lone scholar. We build our ideas, we go to the archives, we work on our own. And I think to do really effective digital history, collaboration is really key. Just the process of conversing as well, one of the things you'll need to keep doing is explaining why you want things. And that's really actually really good practice for any historian, any time to say, yeah, we, we're trying to do this. You need to find ways of helping people to speak the same language. So we developed lots of little strategies. We had reading groups where we got data scientists reading up on the historiography. We had coffee and code sessions where people who had coding problems could get help from the more experienced research software engineers on the project. And most importantly, we designed our work packages in such a way that we had a really um, three-dimensional kind of approach to um, each problem, bringing people from the different disciplines together in really productive conversations around our key topics and research questions. This is certainly the real highlight of the last five years, is I've learned more in those years than I'd learned probably for 20 years in terms of methods, because I'd been doing you know, incremental advances in the things that I knew. Now I've been trying to grapple with a whole series of possibilities that I didn't even know existed. It's incredible the opportunity that, that we've had to really build a community of scholars who have shared concerns. There's a real respect for everyone's expertise and interest in learning from each other uh, and doing that work side by side, doing that work together. I have uh, had the best colleagues, like brilliant people, like combination of kindness, generosity, curiosity, uh, excitement, openness to try new things. And uh, this is something that I will certainly miss. We listened to each other. We asked each other, for you, for your discipline, what do you hold dear? What does success look like? That's an investment in your people, your culture, and the direction of the project. Listen to each other, because together, 
bringing lots of different perspectives. I truly believe we make better research. Collaboration has become a very important kind of self-reflexive topic on the project. So we're doing collaboration, but we're also thinking a lot about how we do it. Early on in the project, our advisory board said, you need to write about this because people want to know about it. They want a handbook. And we started writing these reflection documents where the whole team would say what's working for them and what's not. In the spirit of collaboration and radical collaboration, this book was co-written, sharing the same document. Uh, we wanted to make the process of writing as collaborative as the reflection and as our experience at that point of the project. And so we used people's th words and thoughts from the project and then the four of us um, who wrote the book, uh, we synthesized that into a document that spoke, spoke for the team. It was a process that was between editing, curating and writing. They were great collaborators, very generous in terms of how we edited and commented on each other's work. Some of us were very wordy, some of us were very good at cutting out but we have been also extremely honest about the challenges and the obstacles that we encountered in the project. We believe that sharing also the difficulties that we have had to face and how we overcame them over time is a way of contributing to future research. To think about how you start a project up, um, how you get hold of data and get it into a format uh, that you can use, what kind of infrastructure and tools you need to do the analysis, and then how you hold that collaboration together as it evolves over time. And one of the things that's just really joyful is when you're doing your own research, um, nothing is ever going to get written on your book. No progress is going to be made unless you personally open up your laptop and start writing. When you're collaborating and you've got a block, um, you can just literally see the Google Doc in front of you being taken over by somebody else and you can just see the words emerging and appearing on the page and it's just wonderful. The narrative around digital humanity is often uh, is kind of phrased in a way where we can take methods from the sciences and data-driven methods to tell different histories, to tell new histories, to tell a picture of the past at scale. Uh, and I think that we're proving that on this project. But I think we're also trying to invert that story, to think about actually what um, people from a humanities background bring to a data science institute. We are critically analysing the impact of tools in the process of studying the past an understanding of how the sources that come to us are biased, how um, we, we're, we're always working with partial data and how we mitigate against that, how we contextualise that, and how we are sceptical about what the data shows us, how we try and read against the grain. And it's this critical angle that comes from the humanities and it's, it's the essential component of living in machines. It's the humanities that can really help data science make its work applicable and really understand society and shape it for the better. The key things about the humanities is that it, it won't tell us ready-made answers for the future, but it can give us a lot of clues to the ways in which human society, human culture adapt to radical change. The topic is actually very relevant right now. In studying the 19th century, you're studying a period of very radical technological and social change driven by, in this case, the machine age, the Industrial Revolution is really the first example where we had very, very um, significant and momentous changes in people's lives across the board when perhaps it seemed like things were happening around them that they couldn't control. There were lots of innovations with uncertain outcomes. The shock that it brought to their lives, but also the possibilities that it brought to lives. and How much the way we function today um, is, is so much the result of th that time, that's so crucial, I think, for understanding who we are today. You know, historical analysis can, uh, you know, can really bring, bring in those connections and, and, and teach us something about what it means for humans to interact with machines. Living with Machines, because it studies the Industrial Revolution, covers a huge period of time where Britain was under great change and industrialization practices really changed what it mean, meant to be people. The same may be happening now. We're seeing another revolution, thanks to AI and thanks to digital methods. What can we learn from the challenges of the past to help shape that bright future for the UK?
one of the, the nicest thing about living machines is that um, the people who've left early have got like the best swag with uh, our branding on it. So there will be a bunch of people moving around the world with their living with, with machines hoodies.